In addition to MCAST, a subscription to emedhome.com includes over 1,000 video lectures from the best EM conferences, with more added all the time. View on any device whenever and wherever you want. All this and so much more, including hundreds of CME credits each year for the low cost of only $99. emedhome.com, for 20 years the homepage of emergency medicine. Subscribe now. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to this special edition of EMET Homes EMCast. This is Amol Matu from the University of Maryland School of Medicine, and welcome. Well, I know everybody out there, everybody in the entire world is going through some terrible times. We're in the midst here in the United States of this coronavirus or COVID-19 pandemic, and various areas of the country are being hit really, really hard, and the rest of us are waiting for the surge to happen. It's a very ominous feeling. We are trying to get as much information as possible about what to expect, about what type of medical issues we're gonna be dealing with. And a lot of what we are learning is from people who are already in the middle of the research and also from some of the international folks out there that have gone past the peak and are now trying to pick up the pieces of what this pandemic has done Uh, to their medical systems. And so here we are on Sunday, March 22nd, doing a recording to talk about some of these issues. And I'll preface all of this by just letting people know this quality of recording is not what we normally would like, but we do have to do this in uh, somewhat of a remote way. I'm going to be having two guests come on board. We are, of course, practicing social distancing. Normally, I like sitting down with them in my office, but we have to do this over the computer. And so the recording quality is not going to be quite as good, but hopefully you're going to be able to get the key points out there anyway. I don't want to go through the basics of COVID. We've heard so much from China and South Korea, Italy and Washington and now New York City about a lot of the basics. But I did want to talk about some of the newer critical care issues and airway issues that have been coming out recently. And in order to do that, I I wanted to get two of the absolute smartest people I know, some of the best clinicians I've ever known. Unfortunately, they weren't available today. And so instead... Instead, no, I've got two fantastic colleagues. You know, in this day and age, we've got to find something to laugh about, right? So I've got online with me Dr. Ken Butler and Dr. Mike Winters. And for anybody out there who knows me and who knows these guys, they absolutely know that I'm totally joking. Ken and Mike really are a couple of the absolutely smartest people I know, two people that, without exaggeration, I would have any member of my family taken care of by them without hesitation. So just as a little background, Ken is our associate residency director. He's uh, one of our senior faculty. He's been on faculty for quite some time and just an outstanding educator. And he's our airway guru. He has taught not only our residents over the past maybe 30 years or so, but he's taught hundreds, probably thousands of uh, physicians out there airway skills through his courses. And I've also got Dr. Mike Winters, who, as you know, he's our critical care guru here at university in the emergency department. He's also our vice chair of, I guess, vice chair of operations is how I would describe his role. And so Mike has been in the thick of pretty much every godforsaken administrative meeting we've had over the past couple of weeks. And, uh, and, And both of them have been working clinically amidst all of this stuff that's been going on here in Baltimore. So first of all, Mike and Ken, thanks so much for your precious time. I know it's very limited in having or in taking the time to, to come and talk to us about some of these issues. I really appreciate you guys uh, making the time for this. Well, thanks, Amal. We're happy to join you on this very, very important podcast and the opportunity to partner with you and Ken and talk about a little bit of clinical care as it pertains to COVID-19. Very, very kind introduction. So thank you. Thank you. I agree. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, for, thank you, guys. And Mike, I'm sure this is a reprieve from all the administrative hassle that you've been having to deal with recently. But we're, we're going to primarily focus not, again, not on the basics, but some of the critical care and airway issues in the patient with known or suspected COVID. And Ken's going to take us into kind of a deep dive regarding the intubation issues in just a bit. But before we get there, there is some really important critical care issues that have been brought up from the physicians around the world that have been taking care of these patients uh, that are in later stages that we haven't even seen yet here in Baltimore. And Mike, can you 
first of all, just take us through some of those issues, critical care issues that have been emerging in the literature and also perhaps from some of our own hospital experts and get some of your thoughts about some of these critical care pearls and pitfalls that we should know. Yeah, definitely, Amal. And I think you said it right a few minutes ago that we're recording this here on Sunday, March 22nd. And it could be by the time that our listeners hear this, components of what we talk about today are even going to be a little different and altered as we continue to gain experience managing these the critical care patients who are infected with COVID-19. And in terms of that, there, there is a lot of debate and there's a lot of discussion, a lot with, that we're learning over the past even seven to ten days about the illness itself. And, you know, I've heard it amongst many inner circles described as, you know, kind of a three-week illness. In that first week or so, folks are presenting with the typical viral symptoms that we would have with any influenza season or any other viral illness. And then sometime during the second week, that seven, eight, nine, ten day range, maybe even twelve day range, patients are relatively abruptly and quickly decompensating from the pneumonia aspect of it. They're presenting in respiratory distress. They're presenting with significant hypoxemia and needing some degree of resuscitation, probable airway intervention, institution of mechanical ventilation. So those are a few of the things that we had talked about focusing on. And I have to say that I'm not sure that anyone knows the exact right answer as to how to manage these patients. If we just step back from the COVID-19 epidemic and pandemic, when we have someone coming in with respiratory distress, depending on what the underlying etiology is, we have a lot in our armamentarium to treat them with from a respiratory distress standpoint. We could administer bronchodilator or nebulized bronchodilator therapy. We could use non-invasive ventilation strategies, and that could be either high flow nasal cannula, that could be non-invasive ventilation that would be CPAP or BiPAP. And then if they fail that, we could then move on to intubation and institution of mechanical ventilation. So those tend to be a lot of what our armamentarium is. And there's a lot of questions, significant concerns around the, the initial portions of that, namely aerosolization, bronchodilator therapy, and then the use of non-invasive ventilation strategies with high flow or BiPAP or CPAP. And that's because we are very concerned about aerosolizing this into the room with others and then subsequently infecting other patients because of the way that COVID-19 is transmitted via respiratory droplets. And there's lots of guidelines and I think societies international and national organizations are kind of scrambling to get some things in print and online for their members to help guide them through when these patients present with abrupt decompensation, respiratory distress. And there are some out there, and I think that as we kind of walk through that, we can hit some pearls and potential pitfalls. And to that end, Amal, when someone's coming in and, and you have a very high suspicion, I, I think at this point we're going to move away from at risk versus no risk and simply say sick versus not sick. I think we're getting to that stage in the illness and, and treatment across at least the U.S., and I know many of our international colleagues are well beyond that. But in someone coming in with minor respiratory symptoms, you're going to undergo your evaluation and management algorithms as you've all instituted at your respective organizations. But when you start to see the hypoxemia, you know, provided that they're in, not in significant distress and they're not, they don't have significant comorbidities, you know, starting off with providing them with a little bit of supplemental O2 via nasal cannula, just a few liters is probably reasonable. But as they progress along that disease spectrum, what do you do with high-flow nasal cannula or non-invasive ventilation? And I, when I say non-invasive ventilation, I mean CPAP or BiPAP. Some have said, avoid it. Don't use it because it is a high-risk procedure or high-risk treatment that will result in aerosolization of the virus. There are other organizations and folks that feel that you could give it a try and have lower settings and the general thought is in patients who are presenting with significant respiratory issues and hypoxemia due to COVID-19, in contrast to patients without infection, we're going to have a lower threshold for intubation and initiation of mechanical ventilation. So I think 
That's pearl number one, maintain a lower threshold institute mechanical ventilation. There may be a few folks with mild to maybe moderate disease that you might consider trying high flow nasal cannula on in terms of improving their oxygenation and it has been used a lot in China to treat patients with refractory or severe hypoxemia. I think overall we have to understand that there is the risk of aerosolization and there also understand and balance the risk of mechanical ventilation because that in and of itself does carry a higher morbidity and mortality. So for the folks that have recommended go ahead and try high flow nasal cannula, it's much more of a lower initial setting to see if patients do respond. If you're going to opt to utilize the non-invasive strategies, high flow nasal cannula, they should be done in a negative pressure room and then also consider placing a mask over the device itself once you've placed that on the patient. So a mask over the high flow nasal cannula device but there, there are inherent risks of that procedure. Once you have someone on it, you're going to take a look at them within 45 minutes to an hour, and are they improving or not? If they're not improving or if they're starting to progress, then you need to move to intubation and mechanical ventilation. So I'd like to be able to say at this point, Amal, that we have clear and definitive answers as to who would benefit from high flow and non-invasive ventilation, but we don't. We're all learning together. We're all disseminating information as quickly as we can via social media and in print. And just understand, all of our listeners understand that this is in flux and that you will hear some say, don't ever use it, go right to intubation. But intubation in and of itself does carry higher mortality. So if you are going to, in your institution, your critical care colleagues decide that this is not necessarily prohibited, but could be tried. Low settings, in a negative pressure room, and then as best you can, trying to put a mask over the high flow nasal cannula. Now between the two, BiPAP and high flow nasal cannula, at least the literature that we have, probably would lean a little bit more towards high flow nasal cannula um, for folks with COVID-19. All right, so thanks Mike. That does certainly throw a wrench in a lot of what we've learned about how to take care of patients in respiratory distress and perhaps avert the intubation. And it sounds like because of the concerns for aerosolization with some of these steps, we might have a lower threshold to go to intubation earlier than we normally have in the past with these patients. So let's say that we are dealing with the patient in whom we've made the decision to go forward with intubation. Let me throw things over to Ken. Ken, you are the airway man, and you've spent a large part of your career teaching us all about proper airway management, but COVID has actually messed up a lot of the things that you and other airway experts have been teaching us. And, and there's been a lot of discussion online and social media about optimal airway management. And there was even an article published recently on behalf of the Safe Airway Society. I didn't know that right. uh, such an organization existed, but uh, but it's from Australia and New Zealand, I guess. And they talked about airway management in adults which uh, with COVID, which brought up some interesting points. Can you take us through their points and perhaps let, let's just do a simulation here and we've got a patient who's really sick and we've decided that we're gonna move towards intubation. Take us step by step about what we should be doing. You bet. Thanks again, Mike and Amal. So let me just take this, if I can, from the top and give you my pearls from what we do know as of today. And and again, as Amal and Mike have said, I think our data and what we're getting is changing all the time. But I think the key thing to start the game for me is this. These patients have silent hypoxia, meaning that they're hypoxic without dyspneic. And you should have a very low threshold to intubate them because if you look at even what came out of Hunan is that on the SARS outbreak, patients that got CPAP didn't do any better and it delayed their intubation, which is really what they needed. So that's kind of where we need to go. Where this procedure that I will verbally walk through you with is really to protect you, the intubator, and your intubation team and not spread anything. And if you're just missing some of the general thoughts is that non-invasive ventilation or positive pressure causes an inadequate seal. So you, we've all seen patients on CPAP or BiPAP and we can hear the leak and that's what we're trying to prevent. And high flow nasal cannula may also be at a risk for this. So that's where we are. But more importantly, 
putting an endotracheal tube and, and using laryngoscopy is an increased risk. And why do I say that? Patients maybe get agitated due to hypoxia. And if they're agitated, they're also going to spew more of a droplet. They have to have their PPE removed before we even start the intubation. And usually we're close to the patient's airway, which increases our risk. So we don't want, we're trying to back off on all of that as best we can. So we'll start the game with this. You need to revamp your RSI checklist, and it needs to be done in lieu of a COVID patient. Well, what's really different about it is that we need to have these viral filters, a video laryngoscope, because we were learning that DL places that are close to that, and everything needs to be disposable and have disposable blades. As Mike alluded to, if you don't have a negative pressure room, you can use a normal room. You just need to have the door shut before you start. Now, let's talk about the team that's involved. The literature says, and it makes sense to me, that the person that's intubating should be the most experienced intubator. And you should exclude people in your staff, if you can, if they're over a certain age, 60, 65, immunosuppressed, and as of today, pregnant. So we need to make sure that those are not involved because we don't know where this is going to go, especially with young residents, if you have those in your practice, as we do, that may be pregnant. One key thing I want to throw at you is this, please. There should be a team member that is outside the room that monitors everything that you do. And I'll raise my hand. It's the most common time that we infect ourselves is when we, when we take off the PPE. So I personally use a double glove technique so that if I'm done with the procedure, and I've taken off the gown and that first set of gloves before I touch my, in my case, the papper, I have my underlining pair of gloves on to prevent any other transmission. So now let's start the game. Heads up, meaning every patient should be at 45 degrees and, and maintain that position if you can because that increases any type of airway delivery to the lungs. I think that we've all learned that, right? What you can do, and I think this is about the simplest way. I've looked at many videos, and there's a lot of MacGyvering of how to put pre-oxygenation on a patient. But my thought is this, please. The more devices you have, the more risk for leak, and the more risk that you have for them to become disconnected during the procedure. So let's go back. I would take a non-invasive mask, which has a blue elbow on it, something that you would have used with CPAP, hook that onto the patient. That then goes onto a viral filter, and then that goes onto the entitled CO2 in the system. You then hook that up to the bag with a peep valve or a standard BVM and put that onto the flush rate of, of about 30 liters. The patient's breathing, the patient has a tight seal, the viral filter is on, and we can do entitled. That's our pre-oxygenation. But I want to make this really important, please, is that you put this on the patient with a very tight seal before you put the oxygen on. Because once you turn up the O2, if that seal wasn't tight, then you're going to disperse droplets. Second thing to do is that the same in reverse, that every time you go to the O2 port on the wall, you should stop and take your own deep breath and go to make sure that we're doing this. Now we're going to intubate the patient. We've obviously given the patient a long paralytic. And this is a, a good ploy for rock because we want that prolonged apnea to equilibrate the vent and the patient not to desaturate if it were off. And you're going to turn off the O2 before removing this mask that you pre-oxygenated with, again, not to disperse those droplets into the room. Then VL, we're always going to use VL because we know that we can keep our distance with this and we're not doing DL so we don't uh, get as close as we can to the patient. Other pearls is that you need to make sure your depth of placement of the endotracheal tube is the best as it can be, because this is where the, we, we sometimes forget to do, is it inflate the cuff and make sure it's the appropriate cuff depth before you ever bag that patient. We've all intubated patients in our career, and we've had cuff leaks. We've heard them. We've seen them on end title. This is where we can't come into play. We can't take that risk right now. So the cuff pressure should be between that 22 and 24 that we've all used to be doing. But we don't want to deflate the cuff, then move the tube because we were not in the right position. So be diligent about your, your endotracheal tube length and having the cuff inflated before you put the patient on the ventilator. Last thing, please, is I would delay the chest x-ray until all the lines are placed. If you're doing subclavian lines or whatever to the patient, you're already dirty, unquote, in your PPE. Let's get everything done to the patient before we 
walk out of the room and this way, this way your radiology techs are also not at risk. If you fail on your first intubation at the head of the bed, you should have a small trash can. If, if you took a stylet out or an endotracheal tube with a stylet out, don't take these out quickly. If you do, they should be wiped down with gauze that you should have at the bedside and then placed in the trash can, again, to decrease the possibility of having droplets go into the room. And the last thing I will have to say, this is a good time for anyone of your listeners that's not using succinyl choline, of course, to use ROC, because we need that delayed apnea time, because that's going to benefit you, and not put you at risk as the intubator, and of course, your patients. That's what I've got. Great pearls, Ken. Thanks. Uh, are there any differences in the vent settings once you've got them tubed? And I guess this question really goes out to either one of you. Mike, do you want to take that? I, I just uh, my two cents is that I think from what we we learning about this ARDS pressure with this virus is that we need PEEP. But I will leave that to you, please. Yeah. So I think that certainly there's a lot of pearls to take home and potential pitfalls once we get to ventilation, but. I think just to go back and reiterate some of the things that Ken and I have talked about, lower threshold for intubation, but we can't intubate every single person. So there may be folks on the milder spectrum. You may, depending on your organization and institution, still utilize some non-invasive therapies, understanding their risk. there is a risk of aerosolization. So negative pressure room, if possible. With respect to just nasal cannula, Probably okay just doing two or three liters, but once you get north of six liters, then you're likely to be aerosolizing droplets into the environment. In terms of that high flow, thinking about numbers, if it's something that you've opted to use weighing the risks and potential benefits for that particular patient, we tried to put some numbers around that in our own internal document, and with, a, with high flow, really keeping it less than 30 liters per minute, and if it, FiO2s are getting higher than 50, 60, certainly 70%, that's someone that's not doing well and needs to be intubated. So I agree with all of the things that Ken was saying in terms of the RSI procedure, those precautions, highlighting the viral filter on there. Now, once you've gotten them intubated and moved over to mechanical ventilation, this is truly ARDS or ARDSnet protocol. So depending on your institution, some will say starting off at that 8 milliliters per kilogram of predicted body weight, others are going to do, start off at 6. So that's 6 to 8 milliliters per kilogram, importantly, of predicted body weight, and that is dependent upon gender along with height, not total body weight. Once you've set that, determining your oxygenation goals, in general, titrating to Pulse oximetry readings between 88 to say 92% is what you're shooting for for a target. And when you click on references with respect to the ARDSnet, there are PEEP FiO2 tables, depending on whether you're going with a lower PEEP, higher FiO2 strategy, or a higher PEEP, lower FiO2 strategy. There's some great recommendations, or the tables provide you how to titrate and walk up the degree of FiO2 combining that with PEEP strategy. This is not likely to be something where you're going to put someone up to 100% FiO2 and just keep them on the standard 5 of PEEP. You're going to need to titrate that accordingly according to the ARDSnet protocol. In terms of once they're on the vent, depending on what your critical care capacity and resources are like at your organization, some of these patients may be remaining in your ED for many, many hours. You definitely want to be checking things that we've always talked about. You want to be checking that plateau pressure at least every four hours and after every time you make a change in tidal volume or peak with your goal of plateau pressure being less than 30. If, let's just say, you started with 6 mLs per kilogram of predicted body weight, you then follow a plateau pressure and your next plateau pressure reading is, say, 40, then your step, next step is to decrease that tidal volume by 1 mL per kilogram down to about 4 mLs per kilogram. That's around the lower limit in terms of tidal volume. So those are some, some big things. Amelis is definitely lung protective ventilatory strategies, lower lung volumes, titrating FiO2 and PEEP according to established ARDSnet tables, following plateau pressures, maintaining that goal less than 30. Just a few other things with respect to AR, uh, 
ARDSnet or managing patients with ARDS, we are not going to be aggressive with volume. In fact, many of these patients who are currently in ICUs with our colleagues around the country, they are attempting to aggressively diurese them, so keeping them on the dry side in a lot of prone positioning, um, these folks, depending on where they're at in their disease spectrum. Once again, if you're at maximum critical care capacity and a lot of these patients are now stacking up and volume is building in your ED and they're remaining for many, many hours, it may not be unheard of that some of you may be moving towards proning in the ED. So that, that is one of the standard ARDS protocol therapies. So keeping them in the prone position. And what exactly does that do? Well, in terms of just moving sort of the, the dependent lung, so if you're always in the supine position, this particular virus tends to have a predilection for the posterior lower lung segments. And so if you're laying in the, the patient's laying in the supine position or even with the head of the bed elevated at 30 degrees, those posterior lung segments are always collapsed. And so proning them you are helping to improve aeration to those posterior lung segments. Okay. Any benefits at Trendelenburg then if, if the lower lung fields tend to be more uh, effective? Not that I'm aware of. No, it would just strictly be protein and that it often does require specialized equipment beds that make it sure. much easier to prone the patient. It's not going to be as if you're just going to go in there and turn a ventilated patient in one of our standard ED beds. So there, there's a lot that goes with it, but... Uh, it's something to consider depending on the length of stay and how we continue to move through this pandemic with patients in our EDs. Okay. And just to clarify, you're talking about predicted body weight. Is that essentially the ideal body weight? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, let's wrap things up. There's been just a ton of really great pearls and discussion here. Uh, you know, in, in these unfortunate times, uh, I... I always try to find some silver lining in in things and trying to figure out what is going to make us, how is this going to make us better in the future? And so I know that's a tough question, but let me throw it to you guys. Uh, once this COVID crisis is over, in what ways do you think our EDs and hospitals and our clinical practice uh, will be better moving forward for having gone through this terrible crisis? I, I hate to say this because I'm the I guess I'm the veteran of the three of us, but the Coast Guard model in Latin is semper paratus, which means always be prepared. And I think we've learned a lot that we may not be prepared for the next onslaught, right? We had the Spanish flu, we've seen Ebola, we've seen other viral illnesses and bacterial illnesses that come very quickly. And if there's something positive, I think, for me that comes out of this is that it may not help, will hopefully happen in my generation, but this will happen again. And if it does, it may be worse than this. So we always need to think ahead and have these drills and have supplies and utilize our resources as best we can. And, and again, as Mike and Amal, I'm sure, will agree, is that we approach this as a team. It's not one person's fault that we may not have X or Y. It's kind of all of our fault if we don't have that. So we need to stay frosty, as they say and wait and be prepared for the next, if there is a next pandemic or epidemic. Sure. Mike, any thoughts? I wholeheartedly agree with Ken. This is not going to be the last pandemic that we confront. It's certainly historic for our lifetimes in terms of not only hospital operations, but just environmental and community things that are being done. Certainly, it, I've never encountered anything this in my lifetime. I think some things that already I've learned is, uh, at least in our own medical system, really how emergency medicine has stepped up to lead the way in so much of the response. The key individuals in our response to this are EM, and, and we know that we're really well suited, and I foresee that emergency medicine will continue to lead the way and be at the forefront of ongoing disaster preparedness. It's what we do. And I think we will certainly continue to rise to the occasion and take the forefront moving forward as we have already. I think that in terms of the response, you know, across the country and really across the world with how much people are sharing knowledge, disseminating it via technology has been very reassuring that, that truly we're all in this together. 
and everyone has continued to provide guidance on what they're seeing, what they're experiencing. Folks are out there saying, consider this. So I think that that's been outstanding and refreshing uh, how quickly we're able to disseminate knowledge. I know leveraging technology is probably something that's going to change moving forward from this. I realize that even telemedicine or telehealth has already been implemented in many institutions across the world, but how quickly we've stood up a lot of telemedicine initiatives, they, I suspect that they will be sustained following this response and how they get integrated into emergency medicine in the coming years will be interesting, and I think that that will change as well. So just a few of my thoughts. Yeah, those are all really great points, and I'll, I'll add my own. I, I've been very impressed with the uh, camaraderie and also how well all of the hospital resources have really been pulled together and are working together. Uh, I've been impressed similarly with the international community type of response, scientists all over the world getting together, or even politicians for once getting together and, and working together politicians and leaders from all over the world and, and you just wonder if if everyone is pulling together like this to fight a common enemy maybe maybe we can do this even when there is no common enemy so i don't know if that's just wishful thinking but um but i think that there has to be some silver lining that comes through all of this so with those as some final thoughts again mike and ken i know again how busy you guys are and really appreciate you taking time out of your Sunday. Uh, even though Sunday is typically a day off, I know you guys are very involved and in, in working hard uh, even today on this whole COVID stuff. Appreciate your time. And to all of the listeners out there, please take care of yourselves, take care of your colleagues. And uh, as new developments come out, we'll, we'll try to get these out there on the EMCast. So take care, everyone. Hey, thanks for listening to EMCast. And for listening to the end, here's a discount code for you. Use discount code PODCAST for 10% off each year of an annual subscription to emedhome.com.